In a world filled with sound bites and shortcuts, it's become more important to take the time and perch. Pause. Evaluate responses to circumvent harm. Come perch with me and see things from a higher point of view. Well, another day, another perch. So the conversation, we didn't even begin to scratch the surface. So um, it's leading us into a second episode. And this one, um, Toby, I'm going to let you take it away because it was all about me, the, the first episode, even though I didn't get to a fraction of what I want to talk about. So now it's all about you. Well, it doesn't have to be all about me, but it's all some, about some you. interesting Tell things. Toby, it is all about you. <sighs> well, okay. Well, anyway, th- when we started to talk about this topic, there were a couple things that immediately came to mind, and I, I'm curious of your thoughts around mm-hmm. it. And one of them is that, you know, as the topic is, you don't, What's celebrate, the topic? You don't celebrate a fish for swimming. Okay. Right? Okay. So uh, the first thing I could think of is I, I kind of personalized that and said, the number of people that post on social media the most asinine things um, and somehow pass them off as being either newsworthy or worthy of my taking time or anybody taking time reading them. To me, it's fascinating. So I, I started to look at the, the, the psychological aspects of social media. Um, many of us didn't grow up with social media. Our kids, obviously, it's all they've, they've known, whether it's Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, uh, Facebook. But my mom used to call it my face. Are you on my <laughs> face again? I'm like, mom, don't, you know, no, so, no. But it's amazing that you start to read some of this stuff and, and it's incredible. And then the number of people have done studies on it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote some of those and I'd love to get your feedback. Mm-hmm. So one of them is from a, a, a reading or a blog on everyonesocial.com, uh, everyonesocial.com. And they talk about who's involved with social media sharing and the reasons that they share information. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll throw a couple of them out and get your feedback. So one of them they say is people who are altruistic or altruists will share content to be helpful. You know, uh, hey, the, the, you know, this is going on or that's going on to be helpful. Uh, then there are the hipsters and they share cutting edge and creative content that builds their identity. Not yours, not anybody, but their identity. Edit. Hipsters. Then they've got, keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. Then they've got boomerangs and boomerangs share content to get reaction from audience or to seek validation. And these are the people who post crazy crap, you know, uh, you know, Trump won the election or something like that. And they seek you know, feedback because it helps them, it helps their standing, it helps their status. It seemed like majority of them are boomerangs to me. Yeah, so a lot of boomerang know. going on. And you see it in all walks of life. If you follow sports like I do, uh, people will post things like, hey, that was the the worst play I've ever seen. Or, hey, this team just threw that game. And you're like, what are you talking about? It's ridiculous. They're looking for that kind of visceral response. So is that the conspiracy theory? No, those are okay. just boomerangs. They're people that are eliciting a response to, to mm-hmm. seek either seek validation or to, or to get to get uh, further further you know feedback. And then there are connectors. Those are people that share content to stay connected with others, make plans, things like that. And the other one that I added is the oversharers. Now, he didn't have it on his list, but I'm going to add the so oversharers. Wasn't, wasn't no, no, because to me, oversharers are one that have nothing better than to share meaningless crap in their lives for no apparent reason. So let's add oversharers to that list. So what do you think? I, oh, so if it wasn't for Purge Podcast, <laughs> I know people like this woman does not exist on social media. I just, it really, I'm, I'm a very um, connective person. So social media is so troubling to me. I get it from surface. I get it on business. I know people say, well, you have a podcast. And why would you do a podcast if you have a problem with social media? I was like, but the fact that we literally are have created social media has created a society that's so desperately longing to be seen. Mm-hmm. Till yeah. I don't care what it is. I've seen people in the hospital with IV drips, and before they tell their family, I've seen you know people making a bologna sandwich. I don't like bologna, and I. Damn, I'm sure I don't want to watch it. So don't give it a like. That's I'm a, just like yeah. all of it. You know, look at my, so your, your child needs to clean his nose. All of it. I don't want to see it. Like everybody wants to look at me, see me. And, and what really is disheartening for me is I know people don't have bad intentions, but 
when it's like, hey, I'm in Europe. Hey, I'm over here. Hey, I'm, I'm over happier there. with that than hey, I just made a toasted cheese sandwich. At least, oh. at least going to Europe has it requires some level of effort. It requires them to give a damn about the rest of the world to show that they like to travel, I all to share it. pictures. I put all of but, it in the same umbrella. But hey, I just made this great bologna and cheese sandwich. And I but you know, and I wanted That's to, all to they touch can on something else. Bologna and so, cheese. They can't afford you. <laughs> <laughs> How about Europe on a bologna and cheese sandwich budget? Wouldn't that be no, great? I just... So Jonah Berger is a professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. He wrote this book called Contagious, Why Things Catch On. Mm. And what he talks about is that he, he, he argues that there are two primary reasons why people like things on, on social media or post on social media. He says it really comes down to status and emotion. And so one of the things that he calls out is that uh, this, there's a gentleman by the name of Joe Matsushima. Joe, apologies if I got your name wrong. And he's the co-founder of this company called Denizen. And he was the brain behind this viral hit. Now, stay with me on the title here. Tiny hamster eats tiny burritos. Okay. This thing went viral. Now, I'm sorry. I, I don't even like the name, much less think I'll be intrigued by tiny Hamster eats tiny burritos. So, God is so not why? Pleased. What is this nonsense? Exactly. So why are we so enamored, pray tell, Miss Porter, with tiny hamsters eating tiny burritos? I know you're not looking <laughs> at me for an answer. Boy, I don't think I've ever had you go speechless at me before. I, I, I really, I'm, I really try. This is when perch really, you have to go into that overtime. I really try not to judge people. I really try. I try. God knows I try. <laughs> I, she could be trying to. I too, don't way. understand. I, I don't understand why. And I get clickbait and I get, you know, people are so obsessed with their fingers and scrolling. And I think maybe it's math. I think that's it. Maybe I figured out the problem. It's mm. math. Oh. So, you know, it's so much garbage out there. They're so excited to see something that wasn't really just garbage, garbage. It's garbage, but it's a different kind of garbage. Oh, uh, unique so garbage. So it's a no very unique. Very unique. <laughs> right. Sorry for another so, day. Right. So maybe that's why things just like we, we were so, it's just overload of content and information or whatever. So any little thing that takes us out of all this stupor and mm -hmm. makes us laugh or like, what was that? It, yeah. it goes viral. And yeah. what does that say about our society, people? Yeah, well, it, it's interesting because the, the article goes on to say that, that not only positive things cause this emotion, but negative things as well. And, and uh, the author said negative emotion can ignite social sharing just as much as positive emotion. Outrage can cause people to share just as much as a funny video. So it's not surprising that a study found that anger is the most viral emotion. And the example that they give, and Tell me if you haven't seen 20 of these, but oh, you're not on social media as much. I'm stories like a waitress being left a zero dollar tip sets off a firestorm of social media sharing. Now, first of all, the first thing I say is waitress, really? You know, the 60s called, they want their author oh, yeah. back. I oh, mean, come on. I know you're server, not. Server. I know you're not. Server. You are not judging. Waitress. People. What are we going to call them? We're going to talk, well. talk about stewardesses next. I mean, what are you. we going to Bell hops. I mean, come Toby, on. Serious. Let's move don't on. Don't die on the hill. Come on. That's a deal. I'm going to. Uh, waitress, seriously. Let's anyway, not even start. so the idea is we've all seen these. You know, we go out on social media. It's like I, I just was at a restaurant and I saw a server and somebody had a six hundred dollar meal or some rock star or an athlete and they left zero. And then all of a sudden, everybody just piles on that. We just pile on that emotion. Mm -hmm. So, um, so negative emotions create for whatever yeah. reason. Yeah. Now, I think social media has given a voice to the voiceless. And um, and and they want to believe that relevant. every voice matters. Yeah. yeah, that's all I. Can. But again, I have nothing for you. I, there. I don't. I'm, I don't know what 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 that what you know why people feel compelled to, to to put that kind of stuff. And he even goes on to say that social media sharing is a fascinating phenomenon because liking or even loving something doesn't necessarily lead to sharing it with your peers. Typically, what it leads a person to share something on social media is when it has a connection to them as an individual, be it political, emotional, cute or funny. People want to share with others how they perceive the world and reflect their tastes and how they define themselves. So for whatever it's worth, I mean, again, I think, you know, I, uh, I it, it's, it's so sick when we created a, a society, um, which 
social media it's it's its own society in my yeah, opinion yeah. and we created this and we just look at the intention that was put behind it we told people to follow me to like me mm -hmm. and to heart me right did anyone pause to think about like literally the, if that's not cultish yeah and those are those emotional are words fan, that, we, that supposedly mean a lot more to like somebody means you should probably know them not just if somebody posted i had a, I had cornflakes for breakfast and you like that idea what does that mean so does but, that really does that does that dishonor the word like i mean so but let, let's go so you went there let's go there mm -hmm. so we created a world a fake world a global world where we don't know each other and we invite strangers to follow us. Just let that sit for a while. Mm -hmm. Five, yeah. four, three. That's sick. Who would say to us? It's all, now let's put that in real world context. I'm out at a bar and it's like, oh, and there was an app. I can't even call it an app where like it was a dating app. And, you know, I, I, I was going to call it. I can't even. It makes me sick. I'm not going to call it. But in this app, it was designed when you have it to go out and let other single people know i'm i'm here i'm single i'm ready to mingle, ready to mingle. <laughs> oh like seriously so you invite a strangers to know that you're out in an area find me follow me to strangers and our cat has decided to join the conversation because well, she, she always has something to say doesn't she maggie has had you know <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I, I want I want in on this. Exactly. But yeah, so I, I really wish people would think. Um, and then we create it. And then we, we wonder why after we created this site, society to say, follow me, like me. Mm -hmm. um, and and we literally look at numbers and, oh, I need to get more followers. I need to get more likes. So big question I, for you. What mm -hmm. did, did COVID accelerate this? Did COVID create more of a of a feeding frenzy for this type of kind of dysfunctional relationships if you will where people just said oh i have to stay home to be safe the only way i can socialize with people is through social media or was it well on the way to and to i'm ruin sure that? i don't know the, and I, of course i'm just going to give you my thoughts but i'm sure that they've done studies and research one thing i we we all could see that the 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 positive i think maybe covid even caused people to kind of shy away from it because it became embarrassing how many hours did mm. you as soon as apple and all these other companies start creating your screen time mm. people kind of got a little shame i was like oh my god what mm. you know and so then you saw people which is kind of sick too because they start then you saw you know people start crocheting and knitting and bake and then it was like people became obsessed with baking bread during a pandemic but is it possible that oh. one of the fish for swimming type of things mm -hmm. is that people started to post their everyday things because it was the only way that their friends could see them doing these everyday things i did the laundry today you would have known that if we were communicating and we were going out and we had a normal life but COVID has locked us down so i'm going to tell you i did laundry I mean, is it possible they that they were it, doing that way? Don't, 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 okay. don't even, you know, they were doing that way before. COVID. Yeah, I, I agree. But, but one of the big changes, seismic changes mm -hmm. is we stopped going to work, right? If we can kind of transition to that. So we stopped going to work. We started now to work from home. And so some people, you know, some professions were already doing that, but then the majority of people were not accustomed to working from home. Right. So all of a sudden we changed the dynamic of how we socialize with people. And now it made it, I would argue it made it harder for us to know whether we were plotting a fish for swimming or for like my analogy in the previous episode, a fish for jumping a foot and a half. So are we now applauding a foot and a half? He, he really go every time we talk, tell a story, you go get the he fish was, more. He was inches. incredible. He was incredible. Okay. What, a, what an athlete. Well, anyway, so the idea is now all of a sudden people are working from home mm -hmm. and there's an ex, there's a certain expectation that people have to be recognized. And if you're at work and I'm in the office and I come over and say, hey, boss, oh. here's the work I just finished. And the guy says, great job, great job, great job. Now I'm sending an email and I'm sitting waiting for this accolade. I'm just waiting for it. I refresh. I'm waiting for it. It's going to come by any second. I'm <laughs> refresh again. Maybe, maybe the boss went to the crapper. Okay, wait a can minute. I, I'm waiting for, I, a I, for a refresh again. Has this changed the level of what a fish swimming is? I am. I got to tread lightly with this one. <laughs> Ooh, I got to tread lightly. Cause, okay. I am just sharing my views. 
because I do have an employee. Uh, and I do have, so I am just sharing. You know how they do that. Uh, the thoughts and opinions of not yours. They're not necessarily. Uh, yes, yes but, this is just a perch moment. So people perch. I'm not saying this is what tree should believe. However, comma, mm -hmm. um, corporate America now. And, and I was just reading this and I had some articles to support this too. Um, is into recognition, praise, praise, recognition, recognize, praise. How often we are literally measuring in corporate America, not necessarily my corporation, at corporations, they measure monthly praise. Mm -hmm. Did you let a month go by? Did you, how often the, the level in which you pray? It goes back to what I said, the previous podcast or whatever. What are we applauding? actually what are we praising what are we recognizing because if it's not real for me i don't want it mm -hmm. in relationship and everything else if you literally your quota is you have to praise your employee once a month and on the 29th or the 30th oh trisha great job keep it mm -hmm. but this is the society what we are creating that goes back to look at what we we're creating it starts with the follow. It starts with the like. Now it's in corporate America. Mm -hmm. Now it's in our homes. It's participational. It is literally uh, the, <laughs> take the trickle down economics. It is trickle down. It, that's my it's, point. It, 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 and I was going to go there to say, isn't something. it because we started at an early age and people accepted that praise? It gets back to what you said before mm -hmm. the seventh place trophy. Mm -hmm. I'm used to getting praise for for. I won't necessarily say underachieving, perhaps just doing what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm used to getting that praise. I'm used to getting praise from 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 my from my teachers mm -hmm. for doing just the most basic. I'm used to getting praise from from my Disney dad or mm -hmm. my, my my family because, you know, my mom and dad are divorced and my dad doesn't want to say nasty things about me in the few times he sees me or my mom, you know, recognizes that it's difficult for me growing up without a father. So we've created this culture, and this ex expectation that we are now going to praise the the normal. Mm -hmm. So now this person works, moves into the workforce. Mm -hmm. What are they looking for? They're looking for being applauded to swim. So let me just be totally transparent. I did not grow up and I recognize my weaknesses and I recognize the lack thereof. When I had a restaurant, I owned a restaurant in California. It was a shop owner that was next to me. Uh, shout out to v Veronica Ramirez. I haven't seen her in years. Veronica didn't have any children, but she was a hardworking, you know, uh, Mexican woman who had a big family and she loved her niece and nephews and they were like her kids. I learned so much from Veronica watching her praise her family and children. I had never, now mind you, I was grown with two kids of my own. I had never seen children praise for like, she was, thank you, mija. Thank you, mija, for every little thing. And I started watching that and it was like, wow, but it was true. And it was real appreciation because they were good human beings mm -hmm. and just good kids. So she and was she enforcing was positive behavior. She was enforcing. She wasn't part of it. Absolutely. But because I wasn't, I grew up old school, Southern raising, like, I, what am I thanking you for? You know, right. you're supposed to cook. You're supposed to clean. You're supposed to wash. Um, I didn't even know what, um, I don't even know what it's called. What, what is it called when it gives you, um, when you have chores and they give you allowance, I feel like a game allowance. show. Yeah, really. Sounds, chores, like, sounds yes. like, yeah, allowance. When you have yeah. chores, allowance. Yeah. yeah. I, what, I, pff, allowance. Yeah. I allowed you to live in my house. Well, I allow but, you to eat my food. But what you're talking know. about here is, is something we talk about in corporate America all the time, and which is different people are motivated by different things right mm -hmm. you'll meet people that say you know what you can call me whatever you want as long as you pay me or i get a raise or i get three weeks of vacation a year and there are other people that are like all i want to do is is receive praise you have to you have to appreciate me i need to feel appreciated but so it? isn't it possible you know and then i'll mm -hmm. shut up isn't it possible that at an early age we recognize these these traits in our kids and say oh this 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 young man here he really needs praise he 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 either lacks confidence or he needs that and that will drive him to greater things so this is what i have to say because it sounds like double talks like wait trisha are you for i am for what is real i am for what is genuine and i am for what is honest that's it and i think you know and that's for our children for everything else when you realize like you said when your son goes out he went above and under 
you know, good job. It's still lost, but good job. I, you don't have to tell him he's still lost. I just don't tell him he won. But, but, but my point being how this relates to business too. I walk around every day and my praise is genuine. Mm-hmm. I have some, I have some really great team members that help each other out. Go, I really do. And it's genuine. And I praise certain individuals often because they do it effortlessly. They don't do it for praise. They don't do it for the, that's just who they are and say, and I have to point out to you, you know, that you're a good soul. You get, and I've used this person example, how in business, you know, you can let your humanity lead. Humanity can lead you in business and, and you don't have to be cutthroat to, to, mm-hmm. to, to get ahead. You can find a way to bring everyone right. in and rise up. So absolutely. Do I believe in praise? That's genuine. Yeah. I don't believe it because, the, you know, like Cinderella and it, the clock struck midnight and I got to get it in before you turn into a pumpkin because mm-hmm. you've been a pumpkin all the time <laughs> and you never turn it in and you never turn into a princess. And so now I'm supposed to applaud a pumpkin. But when you turn into a princess. A but you, you mentioned before when you were growing up that your your reward was you got to have a, you know dinner that night. And, and, <laughs> and I mean, you know, there were situations where, I mean. I remember growing up, I, I would come home being proud that I got a you know, 94 or 95 mm-hmm. in, a, in, a, in a test. And the first thing out of my dad's mouth is, well, why didn't you get 100? Mm-hmm. And to me, that was not motivating. There was nothing motivating about being told that I worked my butt off and was 5% short of that. And that, why didn't I get that? So to me, that was a very demotivating type of thing to mm-hmm. say. So sometimes he might have considered it praise or, or motivation. And to me, it was far anything far, far from that. So... You know, obviously that's that's a that's a difference but i want, want to go back to as we talked about this work from home idea and it's, it's interesting because um uh, we, we live right outside of detroit now and gm uh, a couple of months ago tried to bring everybody back uh well that didn't work out uh, quite so well yeah really fail so but um a, a, a recent me- um, article in fortune magazine written by a terry kurtzberg she's the professor of management at rutgers and a couple of things the, the headline of this particular piece was the return to office wars could end in a stalemate as we all reach the same conclusion about what the flexible future of work means. I want to read you a couple things out of here. I think it's interesting. She says, Mm -hmm. as advancements allow for more and more of a human feel in our online interactions, work locations may become less relevant. In the meantime, when working remotely, we need to know what our work comprises and what criteria allows us to know whether it's done well. This is the holy grail. What makes us know that this job, another job, or any job has actually been successfully completed? Lately, we've seen a large number and variety of attempts to make hybrid work work. It turns out we've learned a few things about what doesn't work. It doesn't work to have employees commute to the office only to find themselves alone, logging into online meetings just as they would from home. It doesn't work to have people to have some people on site and others dialing in. The imbalance in being fully part of the conversation is apparent to all. It doesn't work for leadership to be in the office while technically allowing some to work from home because those who show up end up being favored and everyone knows it. Well, let's sure to say amen. That's all I have to say. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so of course you and I both work remote. Um, I work in an office, you know, more often than you. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what I, 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 I should get tired of saying this. Two things can be true. And in this instance, I, when we say, you know, it, cause I think around the globe for people that work remote, the discussion was, you know, um, can we go back? Okay, what what is normal? Can we get back to normal? And and I'm saying to say remote didn't work, I think it's disingenuous just because for the fact is we know the IT department have been rem- remote for over a decade. Many have, yeah. Well over a decade across the board, across the and they've worked in this environment, you know, well before a pandemic. So it has been done. So mm-hmm. when people say remote work doesn't work, we know that's a lie. Mm-hmm. Now, it's also a fair statement to say it didn't work for a lot of corporations during the pandemic. And also, if you that's look at the statistics, productivity dropped dramatically. And mm-hmm. I, I don't have the statistics in front of me. I should have looked it up. But excuse me, you know, something like 40 or 50 percent drop in productivity. Mm-hmm. Now, how that's measured, I don't know. So that comes back to not necessarily can you work from home as much as how do you? 
wrong, <laughs> you know, because do people have the discipline to do it? Do people have the understanding that working from home doesn't mean you go do gardening and you come in for your, your Zoom call and then you go out to shopping and then you come back for your next Zoom call and then you, there's still an expectation that work is going to be done. And, and it created this whole cottage industry of, of technologies that said, oh, is, is Toby really logged in and is he really active or did he just start a, a, a team's call and he's really off doing something else? So we created this kind of way to try to police activity when at the end of the day, we know productivity dropped. And again, that fish isn't even swimming. He's probably floating upside down. Mm -hmm. He's not dead, but he's just floating. He's relaxing. So how do we now measure? <laughs> if he's not dead already, I will so tell So how him. do we now measure Mm -hmm. productivity in a world where we don't even see whether a person is achieving that or not. And I'm going to add another, a second component on top of that. As a woman in corporate America, I struggle because I know a, a, a lot of companies and will say that's why they make putting your camera on mandatory. Mm -hmm. They want to see that you are at home. They want to see that, you know, that you aren't out at the mall taking this call or I was one time I was on vacation. I told you this story. I was on vacation and I had my, my personal, my iPad out just sitting around the pool. Um, I was in Atlantic city last year, year before last. And the lady that was sitting next to me, um, said that she lived like in Texas somewhere, but she liked to go to Atlantic city to gamble. And I said, Oh, you on vacation? She goes, no, mm. I said, you, your work she goes yeah she was like i just i i've since the pandemic i just hang out at the casino all the time mm. i was like but don't you find it difficult to work and she goes no you know i can take my calls out by the pool and when it's yeah. available and i was like i but i have back to back to back calls i will be at the pool but could you I imagine like how, a how productive can that person so be i mean you know so that's what i mean the, the workforce has changed and so therefore we're looking at this thing you know, applauding a fish for swimming. I mean, you know, maybe we should applaud the fish for just being in the goldfish tank at this point. So but I want to I want to read something else if I could, because I want you to respond to it uh -huh. uh, in the same fortune article. Uh, human exchanges aren't meaningless, whether it's online or offline. We absolutely work better with people we know and trust with whom we've developed an easy pattern of interaction. Uh -huh. It's much easier to ask a colleague who feels like a friend for support on a work task. And we do get to know each other better in person. Technology hasn't yet arrived at the point where human interaction reliably builds relationships. But despite the seamless, endless attempts at forced share something about your weekend conversations <laughs> before video meetings. Yes. Yes. I, I, I do it all the time, though, because yeah. you, you want to, you know, to try to get back to whatever sense of connectivity mm -hmm. that you have. And that's engaging. You have to gauge them in personal stories. Yeah to get some sense of reality yeah. and, and even though it's not reality because yeah. it's just so so i'm in the consulting yeah. business and and we go visit our clients not because it's absolutely you know uh, necessary for the job but that's how you create that connectivity and there's all kinds of science that says you know when people speak face to face there's a there's a level of connectivity there's a level of of engagement that doesn't occur whether it's you know telephonically or god forbid through text or even through zoom so that helps that human interaction and allows a team to be more cohesive but what happens when because you and and this is no slight it's just a, a observation so uh, i'm i'm in corporate america too and now i see that that drones are being used for a lot a lot of our sales tactics. So uh, if I want to sell something to someone over in Korea, I and, and you know what that flight is, so we just ship them a drone and say, hey, walk through this warehouse. Here's the dims. It can show you everything. It's like you're there. But what happens when your business decide that your process no longer works for me? That, like, remember, mm -hmm. just think about it in context because when zoom started and before that you all of us had those old school customers it was like i'm not getting on that camera i mm -hmm. don't like this new and it took them a while to change with the mm -hmm. times and like pick up the phone and call me or come visit me i'm, I'm not saying it's gonna you. it's gonna change overnight but i mean i remember years ago literally flying from new jersey to seattle to sign a contract i got off the plane i walked into the client's office he looked me in the eye and he said are you going to take care of us and i said yeah he goes and he signed the contract. A drone couldn't have done that. No. 
And but June the, Carr couldn't have done that. But then there's a generation after him yeah. that, you know, prefer the level of technology because they think that because I, I, a lot of corporation and business think equate forward thinking with technology. Yeah. So, but technology but, should but, support humanism, not 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 defray it or, or not diminish it. But it's on that business to decide what their preference is and what their standards are. Yeah. So it's a lot of businesses think, oh, because you sent a drone that you're prepared to take my company into the future because you're tech savvy and mm -hmm. you're this and you use you have AI capability and this you're more apt to suit me. Well, then you have your old school business and mom and pop like, right. I need to know your relational. I need, but those are becoming more the dinosaurs. Yeah, but, but, but a drone can't show your I integrity. It. A drone I can't it. show your trustworthiness. It's funny, uh, Jeff Colvin wrote a book called Humans Are Underrated. And one of the things that he talks about in that is that we look at technology as taking over everything that we do. And, and, and he makes a very valid point and says, there are some things that technology will never replace. And one of them is is the human spirit, and one of them is the the art of storytelling. And so the the reality is, as even though we we embrace technology and that technology plays a bigger role, and I'm involved with technology on a day to day basis, it will never replace, or it should never replace, I don't think, the human interaction that allows two people to to interact in a manner and to to be successful in what they're doing. So are you making the argument that in this instance, the technology is applied in a fish for swimming yeah. that the technology isn't you know because it's not real i i took my time i got booked the flight you know i vested time energy i've done i've i've shown up the way businesses show up and and you cheated i believe Houston. that's the new going to be the new table stakes i mean if you go back 20 years ago maybe 15 years ago a restaurant would advertise or a hotel would advertise that it has, it has internet mm -hmm. and and today getting excited that a hotel has an internet is tantamount to sell you know is is praising a fish for swimming. That's table stakes now. That's expect, mm -hmm. expectation. To me, to go above and beyond is to cre keep the human element in the, in the business world. That but I would honestly say, and you know, we've stayed at some really nice hotels, and I get kind of like, I don't, and I get the, the point of that a lot of hotels hasn't progressed with technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was like, why do I still have 232 cable channels in your hotel room? Why can't I just take my iPad and watch what I want to sure. watch and smart yeah. TVs mm -hmm. and I get the the revenue share and everything yeah. behind it that too um, but yeah anyway but mm -hmm. so uh, you know the last thing I wanted to talk about and I think then we'll probably call it is um, this idea that mediocrity is is acceptable we kind of talked about it before and in fact I, I saw an interesting article by a film creator by the name of Mandy Harmon she calls it why we need to embrace mediocrity um, and, and what she talks about in that is that we tend to put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be more than mediocre and maybe mediocre is okay. Um, thoughts? Say that one more time. That one didn't resonate. She said that, that, that really we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be more than mediocrity, mediocre, to be more than, be more than mediocre. Okay, and so we create something and then we start to second guess. Is it really good enough? Is it really that good? And then we say, you know what? It's mediocre. It's fine. Thoughts? Are we saying it's mediocre, it's fine, or all, are we saying this is all I have to give, so I'm giving you this? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll read to you. That's what, what, it, yeah. that's what it, I'll read to you what she said. She said, mm -hmm. on the surface, it looks like we are worried about how people react to our work. We perform mental somersaults to combat the fears and hesitations, asking ourselves questions like, what if people hate it? Will it prove, to, uh, will it prove itself in the market? What if it doesn't perform? Or what if it goes unnoticed altogether? But these fearful thoughts are a Trojan horse hiding behind an even deeper mental hurdle we face. And that is, if we're truly deep down thinking, what if I don't like this? What if it isn't worthy of my effort given? What if I'm not good enough to create the picture I have in my head? So, Ooh, our, that's powerful. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, that's good though. Mm -hmm. I, because I think that's the lens that I know it's hard that we should look through it too, because at the end of the day, I have to, we all have to, goes back to the every tub episode. <laughs> every tub has to sit on its own bottom and leak its own water. We all have to be accountable for what we do in this body and what we say and, and, and how we show up. And I can tie that back into business too. You have corporations selling their soul, you know, for a profit. And, mm -hmm. it, and it, I'm not going to get on that subject because I could talk about that all day because it used to be, in business, the the key um, they will say we turned a profit, a profit, mm -hmm. 
Well, it's funny. And I've been in business that long to know that that was aspirational to turn a profit year over year over year. Now, and then we went to hell in a hen basket when we started measuring it because then it was like we went from 5% to 10% to 20% to 30% to this, to that. So it's like, and, and, and if you don't, and it goes back to our society, business is a re- reflection of society. And if you don't, um, turn like the Michael Jackson, you know, analogy I got earlier when he had Thriller, you break every record in a book and you still need to outdo your highest yeah. record. Yeah. And I think I think you, you you hit on something there a moment ago, and that's cultural. And, and in, in our culture, in the Western culture, it is it is a feel good right now moment type of thing. You said we turned a profit. There are other cultures, and I hope we talk about this at some point in Perch, other cultures around the world that play the long game. And you look at them and they, they invest in a long term strategy mm-hmm. whoops and a long term future. Um, and I think that to a great extent, we accept mediocrity in many cases and we applaud that fish mm-hmm. for swimming because it meets our narrative that we need right now. Mm-hmm. And we're going to applaud you for, for swimming the next time as well, instead of in other cultures and other places where we're playing the long game and looking at what the long term visible visi- viability is of exceeding. So. Mm-hmm. Um, that goes back to that Africa. We talk about other cultures, the African proverb, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's all we have to. And, and corporations want to go alone. They yeah. want to stand out. Disruption is leading, you know, yeah. us astray. Well, mm-hmm. I think we covered a lot in this time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think we're going to call it a, a day for today. And uh, we'll uh, we'll pick up uh, where we left off. Uh, are we going to c- cover this episode or this topic a little bit more? Or are we going to let this one hang? What do you think? I think we let it hang. Uh-huh. And you know, if perch people tell us that it's it's some like you guys got close to close to the surface, but I wish you would have talked about this. Then we'll come back. Then let it. us know. Um, again, always a great conversation, and the whole purpose of these conversations is not just to be conversational is to really push our thoughts and push the way we see things and our views and put them as many lights as possible for us to just um, think again. So thank you for joining us. And until we meet again, we'll chat again. Take care. Bye now.